When Dinosaurs Roamed America is one of the most foundational pieces of on-screen media to my development as a person, and what you just saw was how I'd typically begin my Saturday mornings back in my elementary years. As I've mentioned in previous videos in my 20th anniversary miniseries on this documentary, my parents taped the show for me on VHS when it aired, but missed the beginning, so for me, the film begins at this exact moment. Which means from here on out is where the nostalgia really kicks in. Of course, I'll try not to let it cloud my judgment on how well the presentations hold up to 20 years of paleo knowledge developments and scrutiny, but it'll be a bit of a hard task, considering that overall the Jurassic portion has always been my favorite part of the show, featuring some of my favorite creatures from the whole program, one of which we will definitely get more into soon. But first, let's establish when and where we are for this next segment. So after addressing the end Triassic extinction, the documentary leads into the Hatangian stage of the early Jurassic, squarely 200 million years ago in what is now Pennsylvania. The more vibrant color palette is a nice visual cue for the more active world we're entering, now that dinosaurs are truly coming into their own, and taking over the land from the many other now extinct lineages of reptiles and stem mammals. Right off the bat, this is already an interesting choice, since the early Jurassic is probably one of the most understudied and rarely represented temporal settings of the whole Mesozoic, as important as it is to understanding the evolution and radiation of dinosaurs. This is also probably why it's the overall shortest of the five different parts. Like the preceding Triassic section, this segment is based in the Newark Supergroup, a series of Rift Valley lake deposits created along the east coast of North America by the separation of the old supercontinent Pangaea. Unlike the previous section, because of the creatures used and stated timing, it's a bit harder to actually figure out exactly what rock formation this ecosystem is based on. Since it's specifically set in Pennsylvania, I'm going with the Feltville formation as a starting point, though there aren't a lot, if any, dinosaur fossils actually known from these rocks. In fact, none of the three creatures featured in this segment are known from skeletal remains in the area, just trackways that have been attributed to animals with similar enough morphologies to possibly be them. Since this is the first segment that has an actual plot, we'll go through these three in order of appearance, as relevant to the story anyway. Dilophosaurus is actually the first of these that we see, but we aren't properly introduced to it until later on, and as they say, save the best for last. The show starts us off on a hunt with a group of small theropods that narrator John Goodman calls Centarsis. Their overall appearance and depiction is fine, with the same general issues that I discussed with their similarly sized predecessor Coelophysis in the last video. They're very skinny and can use some feathers, though they actually do a lot less hand pronation than most of the other theropods, and their liplessness isn't as apparent, so kudos there. Also like Coelophysis, their presence is based on footprints only. Their actual body fossils have only been found in the similarly aged Cayenta formation in Arizona, giving the animal its specific epithet, Cayentacate. Once again, sets of tracks called Gorlater from early Jurassic rocks throughout the American Northeast are pretty much the only current evidence of small theropods having lived in this region. There's some minor specific anatomical things to note, like the x-ray skeletal lacking gastralia, and the model lacking or at least obscuring the notch at the front of the upper jaw between the maxilla and premaxilla. The first point isn't unique to Centarsis. Gastralia, aka belly ribs, are a skeletal feature shared across the dinosaur family tree and with other ancient reptilian lineages, as well as modern crocs and the tuatara, but they're typically not included in museum displays, which the show uses for all of its x-ray segments, because they aren't actually attached to the rest of the skeleton. As for the skull shape discrepancy, it's not known whether that notch would have actually been visible in life. It might have just been covered with soft tissue like gums or skin, so it's not necessarily incorrect. Regardless, nobody really cares about these things when talking about this creature. The main issue at hand with these dinosaurs is just what to actually call them, and that leads us to everybody's favorite subject in biology, taxonomic nomenclature. If you're looking at the captions, you might have noticed that I've been using quotation marks around the name Centarsis, which is usually done to denote an invalid or unofficial taxonomic designation. Why is it invalid, you ask? Well, what had happened was, Centarsis is the name the show went with because that was the name at the time of scripting, ever since the dinosaur was first described in 1989 by paleontologist Timothy Rowe and added to the Centarsis genus, which at the time already included an African species, Astrodesiensis. However, it was eventually discovered by some entomologists that the name Centarsis already belonged to a genus of beetles, so in early 2001, both dinosaur species were given the tongue-in-cheek generic name Megapnosaurus, or Big Dead Lizard, by the researchers who brought this to light. Perhaps at least partially motivated by the ego hit against Team Dinosaur, Rowe and some other paleontologists published another study on these two species in 2004, and argued to merge them both into the genus Coelophysis. This more or less became the predominant view over the last 20 years by many paleontologists, who are, for one reason or another, surprisingly sore about the entomologist's naming decision, However, in recent years, there's been further re-evaluation and developments on the situation, 
not just because of the ever-shifting relationships among early theropods, but also because of the general nature of taxonomy itself. At some point in the last decade, the beetle genus Syntarsis actually got merged as a junior synonym of another beetle, Circonotus, so seizing their opportunity, the paleontologists struck back. In a 2020 study which we'll be referencing a bunch later in this video, Rowe and other authors opted to refer to the Cayantacate and Rhodesiensis dinosaurs as Syntarsis once again, although their phylogenetic analyses, as well as various others that were published both earlier and later on, including another in early 2021, consistently found that these species are too distantly related to each other to warrant being in the same genus, as well as too distinct to be merged into Coelophysis. I don't know if this means that either of them can formally be called Syntarsis again, I'm pretty sure that name is sunk for good at this point, but as far as our creature is concerned, it doesn't matter. The African Rhodesiensis species was named first, so it gets to keep whatever the genus name ends up being, seemingly Megapnosaurus, surely to the chagrin of some paleontologists, while the creature from Arizona now needs a completely new name. Ultimately, this probably wasn't even the same species as whatever small theropod was running around in Pennsylvania, partly because the Arizona animal comes from slightly younger rocks, about 196 million years old. So for the purposes of the show, the name or lack thereof doesn't even really matter, but I'm going to go ahead and opt to call it Chelschanaye Kayantakate until it gets a new name. These small predators have a more robust jaw than Coelophysis, which the show interprets as evidence of them having graduated beyond just being bug and lizard hunters. Instead of going after those small meaty mouthfuls, they now have the tools to start taking on big game, and their hunt leads them to the next creature we'll look at, Ankysaurus. This early sauropod relative, which you might have heard referred to as the no longer technically correct term prosauropod, is the geographically closest to the Feltville formation out of all three species featured, with body fossils and footprints known mostly from various sites across Connecticut and Massachusetts. Overall it's one of the more plain looking but solid designs in the film, and not too much of what's shown has really changed about our thoughts on its appearance or behaviors in the past two decades, though there is one specific anatomical thing worth mentioning that is so new that it wasn't publicly known when I was initially taking notes for this series early last year. In a few shots, we get a brief look at what I assume is meant to be a juvenile Ankysaurus, which, thanks to the work of some Yale researchers that was published in April 2021, is now known to have an incorrect skull shape. One of the main things paleontologists have learned about dinosaurs in the last 20 years is that unlike many living non-avian reptiles at least, there were a lot of sometimes very dramatic skeletal changes that occurred as they grew from baby to adult, and this will come into play more greatly when we look at later segments in the film. In the case of Ankysaurus, the new study showed that their skulls were quite different from their parents. Not only did they have proportionately bigger eyes, which you'd expect from baby animals in general, but the entire profile of the head was different, with a much shorter, wider snout, and a general profile and assemblage of features that more closely resemble those of the early Sariscian ancestors they share with theropods, rather than sauropodomorphs. Of course, this probably wasn't known at the time, and considering the budget and production schedule, it's pretty understandable for the studios involved to have just shrunk the adult model for these two or three very brief glimpses instead of trying to imagine what a baby would look like. Speaking of shrinking, I have seen some criticism that the show's Ankysaurus is too large, nearly twice the size of the roughly 10-foot, 3-meter theropods hunting it, when the only skeletal remains assigned to the animal at the time suggest a creature closer to only about 6 feet or 2 meters long. However, some of the larger ichnofossils that have been attributed to it in the 2010s, like Otozoom, have been suggested to support the idea that Ankysaurus could get up to nearly 20 feet, 6 meters, in length. So although we don't really know why the size of the animal was exaggerated in the show, Maybe it was an inference based on related animals that have since been synonymized with the original and now single species of Ankysaurus, A. polyzelis. It's another one of those things that when dinosaurs roamed America might have been ahead of its time on. The other main point worth noting is how these animals move. Overall, they're shown as facultatively bipedal, which means that they primarily walk and run on all fours, but can rear up on their hind legs to reach higher vegetation or give a predator a good whack with their sharp thumb claw. The posture of early sauropodomorphs has been heavily debated for decades, and is one of those things that is still rather unsteady for a variety of reasons. It's known with relative certainty that the very earliest members of this group were straight-up bipeds, and that by the time true sauropods evolved from somewhere among their ranks, they were fully quadrupedal animals with columnar forelimbs that nobody seems to be able to depict properly, but we'll get to that in the next video. Figuring out exactly when and how this transition occurred is the hard part and the difficulty in simply organizing these so-called prosauropods on a phylogenetic tree further complicates things. Without going into the long and convoluted history that all of this entails, the TLDR version is that the animals that are classically referred to as prosauropods aren't really a proper taxonomic grouping, but more like a grade along the base of the sauropodomorph family tree, 
This means there were a bunch of different related but not that closely related lineages that seemed to have independently evolved certain features that were previously thought to be part of a single overarching trend towards the true sauropod body plan, because of course biology do be complicated like that. Large size and quadrupedality appear to be two of such traits. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, what seems to be the weak consensus was that smaller species were largely if not entirely bipedal, while larger creatures, like Platyosaurus, as featured in Walking with Dinosaurs, were mostly four-legged simply due to their large size and assumed closeness to true sauropods. Mid-sized animals like Ankysaurus were more of a toss-up, and many depictions decided to simply split the difference and portray them as doing both, leaning one way or the other depending on the personal preference of whoever was involved in creating or advising the piece. However, like I said, the picture has gotten more complicated than that. For example, what we have of the hands and forelimbs of dinosaurs like Platyosaurus and some other mid-sized to large prosauropods don't seem to show many, if any, adaptations for long-term weight-bearing. In some cases, they were likely simply too short to reach the ground, given the more horizontal posture we now think they had instead of being hunched over, and for others, the arms don't seem to have been able to rotate in such a way as to allow the hands to actually contact the ground in any sort of stable position. This is why you'll usually, if not always, see depictions of Platyosaurus and other mid-sized to large prosauropods as obligate bipeds from about the late 2000s onwards. But then, the Dumahadi Mafube showed up. Discovered in Lesotho in the 1990s, and officially named and described in 2018, this early Jurassic giant was certainly big enough to have necessitated a mostly, if not permanently, quadrupedal stance, at least as adults. But the incomplete remains of its forelimbs show that while the arms were robustly built, it didn't have the straight, pillar-like legs of sauropods. Instead, it seemed to have adopted a more flexed position, with the arms in a slightly bowed and semi-erect posture, the hands still somewhat facing inwards towards each other, in a manner similar to many of the other heavyset quadrupedal dinosaur groups like Ceratopsians and Thyreophorans, with each having independently evolved their own take on the non-pronated push-up position. Parsing through as wide a data set of limb material as they could, the scientists describing the Dumahadi devoted a decent portion of their analysis to early sauropodomorph phylogeny and evolution, charting the development of quadrupedality across the group. Not only did the researchers find that Ankysaurus had proportions that placed it as a quadruped, but their study actually moved it closer to true sauropods than it had previously been considered, which to an extent actually validates a line Goodman states about Ankysaurus's relationship to sauropods, though it still wasn't a proper ancestor to them, despite now being closer than the bipedal Platyosaurus was, which ironically has historically been considered as the classic example of the ancestral long neck. Despite all of this, the degree to which Ankysaurus was a quadruped remains in question, especially since the 2019 study argued that at least some, if not all, northeastern early Jurassic Hubrontes tracks were actually made by this dinosaur specifically, as opposed to a similarly sized theropod, as has been traditionally believed. If true, then this would definitely mean that Ankysaurus was bipedal, at least to the extent that it was good enough at walking on just two legs to make trackways that are, in some cases, several meters long if not more. There are some mostly quadrupedal animals that can and do walk on two legs from time to time, but it's not necessarily typical behavior for them, and the regularity at which Ubrontes tracks occur throughout the region, with few if any corresponding handprints to boot, would have to mean that bipedalism was a regular part of their locomotion. With so many potentially conflicting lines of evidence right now, I bring all this up to say that we don't really know how accurate this portrayal is, though if the aforementioned tracks are to be considered, then perhaps it would be more appropriate to depict Ankysaurus as at least running on two legs, as opposed to being on all fours. But genuinely, who knows? I usually have a clear preference, or at least a pet belief in my head, when it comes to certain shakier or more controversial aspects of dinosaur biology and ecology, but researching this has definitely made me throw my hands in the air and surrender to the uncertainty of it all. Good job, Ankysaurus. You stumped me. Even Spinosaurus hasn't done that yet. After being cornered by the small theropods and ready to take them on a second time, the tables turn for Ankysaurus with the arrival of what is by far my all-time favorite creature in the film, Dilophosaurus. If there is one dinosaur in this documentary that deserves iconic status, this is the one right here. I don't know if the creature designers were intentionally trying to one-up the existing image that Dilophosaurus had in pop culture at the time due to Jurassic Park, but it certainly made a big impression on me in the barely 90 seconds of screen time it had on my VHS version. I mean, just look at this thing. Dilophosaurus itself is already a pretty cool looking animal just going by its skeleton, but the design's shiny iridescent grey-green scales and equally metallic roar more than sealed the deal for little me. On top of this, its role and treatment in the film as this large, dominating and aggressive apex predator is a fairly progressive depiction for the time it was made. Ever since the holotype was first discovered in Arizona in 1942, the nature of how Dilophosaurus got its food has been its own subject of debate among paleontologists, 
The overall thin build of the animal, coupled with its long blade-like teeth, notched upper jaw, and relatively narrow skull, plus the tall crests that probably weren't strong enough to be used as weapons of any sort, were taken as signs of a weak-jawed carnivore that couldn't hunt similarly sized animals in its environment. With a few notable exceptions like paleontologist Dr. Bob Bakker and paleoartist Greg Paul, most depictions of Dilophosaurus casted it as a scavenger that also occasionally hunted fish and small terrestrial prey. In fact, this notion of a rather incapable macro predator was so widespread that it inspired the venom spitting idea of Jurassic Park. Author Michael Crichton at least semi seriously came up with his depiction of a venomous Dilophosaurus as a hypothetical answer to the question of how it could have been a successful hunter. Of course, there is no evidence that Dilophosaurus, or any known dinosaur, was actually venomous, nor did it have the retractable frill that the movie added to its design. Fortunately, when dinosaurs roamed America took cues from Bakker, Paul, and the like, and let's just say, ran with them. It's a triple threat. It can slash, bite, and run. As much as I hate to play into the refrain that science has a tendency to make dinosaurs and other things less... awesome, Dilophosaurus does serve as a clear counterexample to that narrative. In fact, the aggressive predatory attributes of this double-crested carnivore were further borne out by a study published in 2020, the same one I mentioned earlier that tried to sneakily bring back Centarsis. In what was actually the main part of their seven-year study, Rowe and his PhD advisee Adam Marsh analyzed every possible Dilophosaurus fossil known at the time and gave very thorough descriptions and evaluations of these five skeletons, including specimens that hadn't been formally studied in well over half a century. One of the main takeaways from this paper is that Dilophosaurus was actually a larger, more bulky animal when fully grown than commonly understood, owing in part to the fact that the two main specimens that have historically been used for reference were actually subadults. While still an overall lean animal, the adult skull was much more robustly built than its younger counterparts, particularly the notched junction between the premaxilla and maxillary bones, the main reason for the weak jawed idea. This coupled with evidence from similarly sized sauropodomorph skeletons riddled with bite marks and scattered teeth pretty clearly shows that Dilophosaurus did indeed have the power to take on big game and even bite into bone, so the brutal takedown scene in the show is perfectly in line with this new evidence. Additionally, a number of healed injuries on the holotype skeleton, including but not limited to a fractured left shoulder and radius and a broken right hand with a deformed finger, provides further evidence that Dilophosaurus led a fairly rough and tumble lifestyle and was perfectly capable of taking a couple hits and surviving to live another day. Another interesting update this study provided regards the shape and possible appearance of the iconic crests. In this and many other reconstructions, the crests are shown as almost glued on structures that look like separate pieces from the rest of the skull. Their external covering is usually depicted as either tight, usually scaly skin, or a layer of keratin, almost like the cask of a cassowary or hornbill. Regardless, both imply a relatively tough, if thin, layer of underlying bone. There's also the neat little hornlet towards the rear of the skull that curves up over the eye that you usually see as its own independent tip that the back of each crest slopes down to. Now, of the five known Dilophosaurus specimens, only the adult skeleton has decently preserved crests. This means that for nearly the first 20 years of its scientific history, the double-crested saurian was crestless. This of course means that the 2020 study was the first time these structures have been properly and thoroughly analyzed, and it brings a pretty interesting overhaul to our understanding of their appearance, despite their still incomplete preservation. Firstly, they were not separate growths distinct from the rest of the skull. They were actually extensions of the nasal and lacrimal bones, so they probably wouldn't have looked as detachable as they're commonly reconstructed, including in the documentary. Furthering this, the base of the crest along the lacrimal bone doesn't have a clear margin demarcating where the structure itself actually begins erupting from the rest of the skull. In fact, the top of the maxilla and antorbital fossa doesn't seem to have any segmentation from each other or the crest. They all just sort of flow right into each other as one smooth and continuous wall of bone. This interesting detail is the most important part here and deserves a bit more breaking down to fully grasp its implications, so let's get technical for a second. The antorbital fossa which is all just Latin that roughly means the ditch in front of the eye, is the depression around the big hole in the skull. The hole itself is called the antorbital fenestra, fenestra meaning window. This opening, which is commonly mistaken for the eye hole, is a common feature in dinosaur skulls that help to lighten the head. Within the space created by the antorbital fenestra were sinuses, air-filled cavities within the skull that were lined with some sort of skin covering, 
Usually these sinuses would just be confined to the area immediately within the fenestra, clearly marked by the margin of the antorbital fossa. This is the typical condition for dinosaurs, including those with some sort of elaborate skull feature like this. However, because no such border seems to exist in Dilophosaurus's skull, where the fenestra ends and the crest begins, the sinuses likely ran up along the height of the crests themselves instead of just being confined to the snout region. This means that the outer side of both crests may have been air-filled pockets. It might be tempting to bring up the casks of cassowaries, which are hollow keratin-covered structures and supported internally by a thin layer of bone, but the texture of these crests don't necessarily suggest something along those lines. Keratin is a soft tissue that requires blood to provide it with nutrients to grow before it can harden. Think the blood-filled pad underneath your finger or toenails. In cases where keratin grows directly on top of bone, there's usually an array of markings called vascular grooves where blood vessels would go, leaving behind a noticeable surface texture on that part of the skeleton. Dilophosaurus, however, lacks these grooves. Incomplete preservation does somewhat get in the way, but from what the researchers can tell, the surface of the crests are fairly smooth, too much so to have supported a keratin sheath. Given this, a relatively loose, possibly even inflatable covering of either bare or scaly skin would seem to be the only other options. As far as I know, this is a very unique setup with no modern analog to really compare it to, so figuring out exactly how these crests might have functioned will be left entirely up to finding new fossils and further study on the ones we already have. The crests might have also been much taller than commonly portrayed, since the 2020 study found that the spur-like structures over the eyes were actually the base of more crest bone. Again, exactly how much bigger it was and whether this varied between individuals is very much up in the air until more skeletons are found, but overall, whatever the true nature of these crests were, it's certainly quite an update from the classic depiction we have in media like when dinosaurs roamed America. As for the covering of the rest of the body, the documentary presents Dilophosaurus as heavily scaled and studded with rows of what I assume are osteoderms, bits of bone that lay within the skin and are grown over with keratin. There are no known traces of skin from this dinosaur, aside from Eubrontes tracks showing the scaly impressions of the bottom of the foot, if you believe that these are in fact theropod prints. There is a potential trace fossil from Massachusetts that shows what is commonly thought to be a Dilophosaurus-like theropod sitting down, and in the early 2000s, some folks argue that the impressions near where the ankle and belly touch the ground are consistent with the presence of downy feathers on those parts of the body. However, this claim was quickly disputed by other researchers, identifying the supposed feather prints as more likely just being sedimentological artifacts, aka just regular old traces in the ancient dirt that don't have any significance or relevance to the actual print marks. I'm not here to make the case for feathers on Dilophosaurus, but I should note that either interpretation is more or less equally likely at this point, and there's just as much evidence for feathers as there is for scales and osteoderms. Which is to say, none. The design of the show was likely inspired by the proposed evolutionary relationships of early Jurassic theropods, which at the time had Dilophosaurus, Chalchanae, and other early crested dinosaurs as part of the group called Ceratosauria, named after the late Jurassic Ceratosaurus, which we'll look at in the next video. Ceratosaurus is one of the few, if not only, theropod dinosaurs known to have had osteoderms, though at the time, the late Cretaceous Carnotaurus was also thought to have them as well, and it too is part of Ceratosauria. So this was presumably the basis for the show's Dilophosaurus design, especially since Goodman identifies both it and Chalchanae as Ceratosaurus. However, in recent years, the picture has become a bit messier, with most of the early Jurassic theropods now being realized as a grade outside of Ceratosauria rather than a true clade. Like with early sauropodomorphs, as we discussed with Ankysaurus, it seems that Dilophosaurus was part of an early cluster of sorta related but not quite a group theropods, that each saw species independently develop crests and attaining relatively large body size, but none of them necessarily led directly to later theropod groups like Ceratosaurs or Tetanurans. This also makes Goodman's statement about Chalchanae evolving into later theropods like Allosaurus and T. rex extra wrong, since it's actually been moved further away from these dinosaurs along the evolutionary tree than Dilophosaurus is, back with the Coelophysids. While we're still in a scrutinizing mode, I have to take advantage of the awesome sound design for this creature as a jumping off point to briefly discuss another general dinosaur topic that applies to the show as a whole. The sounds that dinosaurs made, and specifically the question of whether they could do a mammalian type roar like we're used to seeing and hearing, is a rather new subject that's only recently gotten serious discussion in the past decade. Like with the question of lips, there really isn't a lot of actual hard anatomy to go off of since we don't know of any dinosaurian vocal cords, but there is enough circumstantial evidence to make some very tentative and certainly generalized inferences. 
Mammals like humans produce sounds through a larynx, an organ in our throats that houses folds of tissue that vibrate when air passes through it. The exact structure varies across different groups, but the ones and creatures that produce what are generally defined as a proper roar are usually long and stiff, resulting in those characteristic deep, rich vocalizations. <laughs> Reptiles are a bit more iffy with their vocal anatomy, and a 2016 study looked at the patterns of sound-producing organs across the archosaur family to try defining at least a baseline for dinosaurian repertoire. By far the most vocal are birds, with most modern species making a variety of tweets, chirps, squawks, and other complex calls through an organ called a syrinx, which as far as we know is unique to them and evolved after they'd split from other dinosaurs. Crocodilians are the other main branch of noise-making reptiles, but they have a more simplified larynx that's different to those of mammals, and it's not clear if they evolved this structure independently or whether it came from a common archosaurian ancestor that they share with dinosaurs. If it was a shared feature, the transition from larynx to syrinx and dinosaurs would have resulted in a so-called silent period, as the former organ lost much of its functionality before the syrinx evolved. But because there's no evidence of dinosaur vocal cords, it's not known when or where that silent period started during their evolution, nor how long it lasted. There are a handful of modern bird groups that lack a syrinx, and so have a much more limited repertoire than other birds, specifically paleonaths like ostriches, emus, and cassowaries, and new world vultures. The 2016 study looked at these guys in particular, as well as some other birds like pigeons and owls, and compared their sound-producing methods to those of crocodilians, finding commonalities between the birdie booms, hoots, and coos, and the deep bellows of their croc cousins, all of which were collectively termed closed-mouth vocalizations and are basically created by trapping air inside their throats to create a resonating chamber. Accordingly, these are all generally low-pitched sounds, in some larger species approaching the infrasonic range below the level of human hearing. Unlike many mammalian calls, closed mouth vocalizations also tend to be the loudest sounds their respective species can make, which makes them prime candidates for display calls and long distance communication. This is not to say that dinosaurs could only have made these specific kinds of noises. We already know hadrosaurs developed their crests, at least in part for specialized sound production, and other lineages may very well have done the same, independently evolving their own unique vocalizing organ setup that is yet to be discovered but it does serve as what might be a better baseline for the default hypothetical dinosaur call. More deep rumbling coos and hoots, less bear cub brays and elephant trumpets, which we hear a lot throughout this documentary and other on-screen depictions that use many of these same stock calls. The final thing to note is of course the presence of Dilophosaurus in this Pennsylvanian setting. As I've mentioned from the beginning, none of the dinosaurs in this segment are actually known from skeletal remains in the area. The dinosaur fossil record in the Feltville Formation is almost entirely footprints. Dilophosaurus, though, is probably the worst case and most out-of-place dinosaur in the whole documentary, hailing from the roughly 193 million year old portion of Arizona's Kanta Formation alongside Chelchanaye and neighboring Sauropodomorph Cerosaurus. In fact, it's often wondered why the segment wasn't just based in the Copper State from the get-go. I think the reason for this is twofold. Firstly, the filmmakers wanted to show off more of the US than just the western states. The majority of the documentary is based in Utah, New Mexico, and South Dakota, all of which are very well known for their fossil formations and the creatures they hold. The eastern part of the country hasn't been as paleontologically productive for various reasons both geological and historical, so while there's definitely stuff known from this part of the country, there's overall less to show off, particularly back in the late 1990s though dedicated study has since started to flesh out a decent amount of these long-known but understudied ancient ecosystems. Insofar as justifying putting Dilophosaurus in Pennsylvania, the genus does have a big presence in northeastern paleontology, to the point that it's been the official state dinosaur of Connecticut since 2017. Ironic side note, its status as the state dinosaur of the place it was actually found in was vetoed back in the 1990s, at least in part because the fossils were illegally taken from Navajo lands and reside in the University of California Berkeley instead of an Arizona museum. As you've probably guessed if you didn't pick up on my alluding to it at various points earlier in this video, the idea of northeastern Dilophosaurus is based on a plethora of footprints called Ubrontes giganteus that have been found across the region, including Dinosaur State Park in Rocky Hill, Connecticut. Though the identity of the track maker has been repeatedly called into question, as I mentioned when discussing Ankhosaurus locomotion, the long-standing tradition has been to consider them as theropod tracks, Dilophosaurus tracks specifically mostly because it's historically been the only large theropod known from early Jurassic North America. Is this a reasonable assumption given that it's half a continent away and millions of years removed? Probably not. And that's the note I'll leave you on as we wrap up our look at this segment of the documentary.
I honestly did not expect to have this much to say on just three creatures of an eight minute portion, and that's including the minute or so of Dr. Paul Olson talking about footprints. But here we are beyond the 30 minute mark. If you've made it this far, then I appreciate your watching, and I hope you enjoyed and learned something new. I'm genuinely looking forward to, and afraid, of getting to work on the next part. The Late Jurassic was my favorite segment as a kid, and there is so much to delve into that I want to make sure I cover as thoroughly as possible, so that'll be a backburner project for the next several months, and probably won't come out until sometime in June at earliest. Until then, many thanks, stay safe, and I will see you next time.